Welcome, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Steptoe's Client Chats. The idea behind those client chats is that we spotlight uh, some of our best clients and um, uh, one of their significant achievements. And uh, sometimes both our clients and we labor in obscurity, so we cannot really speak about what has been achieved, but um, this is not one of those times. On July the 1st of uh, this year, DISH, our good client, became the fourth mobile broadband carrier in the United States alongside uh, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. And um, this was the result of many factors. It was the result of an incredible foresight that this had in accumulating, assembling the spectrum required for, um, for it to become uh, the, the fourth carrier. But it was also the result of a large number of favorable outcomes in a large number of proceedings. There were uh, there was an FCC proceeding, there was a Department of, of Justice clearance process, and there were no fewer than two federal district court proceedings. So here to discuss this achievement, we have Jeff Blum, the uh, executive vice president of DISH, based here in Washington, and Hadas Kogan, the uh, director and senior counsel uh, for DISH, also based in Washington. Welcome to both. Hello, Jeff. Hello, good morning. Hello, Hada. Good morning. So happy to have you. Uh, and let me start where I left off in describing the achievement. There, was, there were this large number of stars that needed to be aligned. To borrow a phrase from one of our opponents made in, a, in their appellate briefs, this was not only a two bank shot, but a perhaps quadruple bank shot. So how did you feel about the chances of this outcome being obtained in the beginning? Uh, did you feel oppressed by what may have seemed an unlikelihood of this occurring? Or were you optimistic from the beginning? Jeff? Sure. Uh... Well, we felt we were right. Uh, so whether our chances of uh, success uh, were clear, uh, we uh, analyzed the merger that was announced in uh, 2018 and felt that uh, T-Mobile purchasing Sprint would have an anti-competitive effect. Uh, and really the concern that we had is DISH, as you mentioned, you know, we've acquired a lot of spectrum, our plan is to deploy the first standalone 5G network uh, in the United States using uh, open RAN technology, cloud-based, software-based. And our concern was that uh, AT&T, Verizon, a combined T-Mobile and Sprint would have the incentive and ability to stifle our entry into the wireless market. Anytime you have a new entrant using a new technology, more nimble, uh, the incumbents uh, have a tendency to say, hey, how can we slow this down? How can, we, how can we stifle it? And the power of the three incumbents, our concern was they would be able to delay our ability to get uh, chipsets and radios and software development and construction crews. So that was the initial uh, concern uh, that we had. Uh, we wisely made the choice to hire uh, Steptoe and Pintelis and, and his team who've been representing us uh, for, for many, many years and their antitrust uh, expertise. Uh, and the direction that we got from uh, our chairman, Charlie Ergen, is let's do a deep dive, uh, let's gather the evidence, uh, let's credibly put forth uh, our position uh, because we believed it was right. Whether or not we would ultimately prevail or not, we felt it was important uh, for us to take this uh, position. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Hadas? Yeah, I would echo um, everything that Jeff said. I think that... Um, the, the question you posed sort of assumes that we would know what the, the outcome that we received, that it was a possibility. And I think when the merger was first announced in 2018, um, exactly as Jeff said, 
we understood the concerns as it related to our eventual 5G um, build out and entry and the ability of a combined T-Mobile Sprint to thwart that entry. Um, I don't know that we necessarily sort of saw the crystal ball of how, you know, Boost would interplay with all of this and, you know, the, the various agreements that we ultimately entered into. But uh, as Jeff mentioned, we understood the facts, we understood sort of the implications, and uh, we believed that, you know, the, the facts and uh, the law were on our side and that, you know, a, a combined T-Mobile Sprint posed harms to both our entry and the, you know, wireless landscape for consumers and competition. And so, you know, we started from there and um, were able to effectively advocate. Yes, I, I often observe that uh, where there is genius, it is uh, often helped by serendipity. And I think uh, your responses also tee up my next question, which is, and you said, uh, Jeff, and you also intimated, had asked that um, um, what we felt in the beginning was let's do and say the right thing and perhaps let the chips fall where they may. And that reminds me of the fact that great presidents seem to have this um, ability to make the public interest converge with their own personal interest. There's no doubt that this, like all companies, all private companies in our economy, uh, has its own private interest. But, but I think the part of the genius of Dish's involvement and uh, effect in this proceeding was the ability to achieve such convergence. And it was you, Jeff, and you, Hadass, who masterminded it. And, and that must have been difficult, particularly when it came to the merger applicants. The mobile and Sprint were trying to merge, and suddenly Dish emerged as the main party uh, objecting to this merger as it was then structured and um, suggesting that um, without uh, conditions and remedies it would not be in the public interest. And suddenly you found yourselves in, a, in, in the same room where those meetings among the many lawyers and distinguished uh, lo uh, lobbyists and others um, um, may have been held for months and considering how to Counter this is objections, and you had to persuade this large group of people that this is position was principled, and um, and that was successful because I I know that by the end our collaboration with um, with those companies was uh, very close and productive. How did you achieve it? I'm sure it was difficult. Uh... Yeah. I mean, we fought uh, intensely against uh, T-Mobile for over a year, saying you know that uh, the merger presented significant competitive harms. But we were consistent uh, from day one. Our position was the merger should be rejected unless there are strong structural remedies that are imposed following successful precedent in Europe to enable the entry of a fourth facilities-based carrier. So someone who has spectrum who could actually build out their own network and compete. So from the very beginning, uh, in every uh, meeting we had at the Department of Justice, at the FCC, California, the New York AG's office, uh, was always the same. Here's the concerns that we have about uh, the merger without a remedy, and here would be the only way to fix it. Uh, so T-Mobile, uh, it was hard fought. We put an uh, enormous amount of resources uh, into Stepto representing us and experts and uh, the amount of filings we made and economic analysis. So I think T-Mobile uh, did not love uh, DISH uh, and Hadass and, and myself because we were uh, the primary opponents uh, of the merger. But when the Department of Justice concluded uh, that the only way to remedy the competitive harm was to in fact impose a strong structural remedy enabling the entry of a fourth, T-Mobile recognized that without uh, the Department of Justice's support and DISH's role in that remedy, they wouldn't get their merger through. 
So it was interesting when we were in the same room uh, with them um, and you know, it worked out in the end and we worked extremely well with T-Mobile because they uh, embraced the remedy uh, ultimately at, at the, the, the key trial uh, in New York before Judge Marrero uh, and saying that the remedy was strong and that DISH can be successful and uh, compete. But it, it was never personal. Uh, we like and respect the people at T-Mobile. Uh, it was business. We had severe concerns about the merger and uh, did everything we could to credibly uh, argue our position. Uh, and as of July 1st, we're now in the wireless business uh, because of, of the remedy. Great. Hadas, what's your perspective on this? Uh, I, I agree with Jeff. I will also credit um, Pentelis, you and your team for all of the research and um, information about the remedies in Europe, <laughs> because you helped us compile those from day one to have in our original filing, our petition to deny at the FCC. Uh, so as Jeff mentioned, that was critical for our advocacy and for the outcome. Uh, and I would also echo um, Jeff's sentiments. It, you know, we we never took the advocacy against us personally. I think at DISH, um, you know, we can often take a position that is sort of the underdog or contrary to other uh, big guys in the industry. So we're not um, unfamiliar with <laughs> you know, some people, you know, not agreeing with our advocacy. And and I and as Jeff said, you know, we we strive to maintain. Uh, credibility, to be consistent, um, to be accurate in everything that we do, and I, it, there was no difference here. So um, the role of the underdog is not foreign to us, um, and uh, once, uh, you know, the the Department of Justice imposed the remedy, and, you know, we then, I think, worked quite well with T-Mobile to, you know, get all of our respective um, interests uh, across the finish line. Great. And uh, let me ask about um, Judge Marrero. Uh, you mentioned uh, the judge, uh, Jeff, and of course he's one of the best respected judges in the bench, a very uh, scholarly uh, judge, a very careful one. And what he said in his decision is that those antitrust cases, and, and let's remember this was a case where a number of states had sued the merger applicants um, on the ground that the merger would not have been pro-competitive. And, um, and the judge remarked that um, those cases are about looking in a crystal ball and making a prediction. So it, in a sense, it's a leap of faith. And, and what you can infer from, from the decision is that the judge believed this. He believed the testimony of Mr. Ergen. He believed that um, this would be an effective competitor, an effective new carrier. And lo and behold, here comes July the 1st, and um, this immediately announces a new pricing plan, a new promotion. So my question is, uh, does the faith that Judge Marrero placed in this, uh, is it an additional incentive for this to compete even more fiercely? What do you think? I mean, yes. I mean, we want to execute on our plans that uh, we're confident we can do. And so the Department of Justice and the FCC and Judge Marrero uh, believed in our plan uh, that the stars have aligned in terms of the technology, uh, Open RAN, the architecture of 5G being ready, uh, our spectrum holdings that we've been acquiring since 2008, the team that we've assembled in order to make this network uh, happen, uh, and then the support of the Department of Justice remedy. So we feel uh, very confident, uh, just like we did in satellite, where uh, we took on the cable monopolies uh, by using a new technology called digital compression uh, that allowed us to offer lower prices, uh, better service, higher quality picture, interactive guide, DVR. So we see a lot of similarities between what we were able to do in TV by bringing necessary competition that we can do it uh, for, for wireless. Uh, so it was you know, gratifying uh, to see someone of Judge Moreno's stature uh, 
write a very long opinion uh, believing uh, in what uh, we plan to do because it was fact-based. Uh, we presented the facts on why we can do this. It's not just uh, a pie in the sky. Uh, we've been building and planning for this for years, uh, so that was you know very rewarding uh, to read Judge Morera's decision approving the merger with the remedy. And that's what did you think of uh, Judge Morera's decision? Uh, I thought, I mean, I agree with Jeff, and I agree with Judge Morero, and I believe that all of our arguments were fact-based, and I, uh, I recognized in the decision that that Judge Morero, you know, understood the the basis uh, for our uh, belief in the fact that we could become uh, the fourth nationwide wireless carrier, that our network was innovative, that we have sort of the will and the spirit and the desire to do it. Um, and it was exciting because, um, as Jeff mentioned, and as you mentioned, Pentelis, we have been working towards the goal of entering the wireless market for more than a decade, um, started acquiring Spectrum in 2008. Um, and so seeing his decision was just really exciting because um, we've, we've, as a company, believed in this vision. We know we can do it, and it felt validating that um, you know others agreed. And the language of the decision, um, you know, just reinforced sort of everything that we've you know been saying, and not just saying, but working towards as a company for a long time. Um, I think when you started this uh, webinar, you noted that there there's a lot of work that gets done, and not often. Uh, can we see or discuss the outcomes? And at DISH, we've been working towards this, and maybe that's not you know apparent to everyone, but we've been working towards this goal. And as a company, we're you know so excited to do this, and so to get that stamp of approval from a federal judge who who looked, who evaluated, um, it it just made it more you know thrilling because we just can't wait to get started. Um, and indeed, you know, obviously it's, it's been underway for quite some time. So um, it just was, it was validating. It was really exciting. Um, and it just gave us sort of more um, air under our wings to keep going. This is a big deal. Uh, and um, I believe that uh, future historians will compare the um, outcome of those proceedings with um, the the major milestones in telecom history, and and those include the breakup of AT and T in the early 80s, which allowed long distance competition from MCI and Sprint, interestingly, and others, uh, as well as the 98 Act, which um, was intended to introduce competition to the um, local. Uh, exchange companies from competitive local exchange companies. Of course, these other important milestones, important as they were, um, also uh, encountered complications. In the case of the AT&T breakup, you had one judge that had to essentially decide the future of the telecommunications industry, Judge Harold Green. In the case of the SELEC um, revolution, um, the incumbents were able to um, to mitigate um, the competitive risk. So, what do you think, uh, Jeff and Hadass, about how this third milestone in telecom history um, has embedded in it more safeguards and more ways to ensure the good, the right competitive outcome? I think it's really we have the resources in order to do this. Uh, it is, you know, DISH planning, investing $20 billion in, in, in Spectrum, uh, building the team at the standards body for three years to make sure our Spectrum is part of the ecosystem and getting into devices, uh, waiting for the right time. Uh, you know, we could have built out a duplicative 4G network, but that would have been a, a waste. Um, and to be patient, to prepare, uh, and I think that is going to make uh, the difference as, as people look back uh, that, you know, when we're able to build out this network and, and show the rest of the world uh, that uh, you can do it 
much cheaply. You can do it more flexibly, more securely uh, to enable all the things that wireless networks uh, are going to be enabled with a different architecture. Uh, and the, the ability to build this out with no legacy uh, is unique uh, and I think uh, different. Uh, and you know, we hope to make you know ourselves proud, but also uh, the agencies who are involved in the merger and the court system, and ultimately consumers uh, and what we uh, are going to be able to offer uh, in the United States because of uh, what we've done and what we've been planning for. And I think the pitfalls of the past were lessons for how to structure the relationship in this case, right? Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, you know, when you have you know a remedy, uh, it, it's never going to be perfect, uh, and it is uh, you know a bridge. I mean, really, the the purchase of, of Boost you know gets us in the wireless business. Uh, allows us to compete, but also it's uh, giving us time to build out our network. And as we build our first city, we're going to be able to connect to T-Mobile's core and offer a nationwide service. So if the remedy was not in existence, we would have had to build out our network nationwide before we turned it on without a single customer. Because of the DOJ's remedy, we can build out our first 5G city uh, connect to T-Mobile's network and offer nationwide uh, service. And as we build out more and more cities, obviously it's, it's better and better. And that's very unique. Uh, and that puts us uh, in a much stronger position than we would have been absent the remedy. How does, how does it feel that um, what you just spent uh, two years living through uh, will likely end up uh, as a prominent part of the syllabus? in future uh, telecommunications law courses? Um, I, I'm excited. I don't, uh, I don't generally think about uh, sort of the, the milestones that we've achieved in that way, um, because right now we have, we have done a lot of work, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and so I don't really look at the long arc of history right now. I'm just sort of we're focused on rolling up our sleeves and and getting this network, you know, built and serving consumers and you know, building a best in class unique network. So, I I haven't really taken the full time to sort of reflect. Um, I'm just more excited to continue moving and uh, to to hopefully add more, I guess, uh, details to the syllabus <laughs> point about Dish um, and to have the sort of revolutionary network that we've been planning for for all of this time. And you just mentioned uh, rolling up your sleeves and a lot of work need, needing to be done, which prompts my next question. So I've often wondered about the thoughts in the minds of um, two term presidents at the end of the second term. I don't know about one term presidents because they may think that uh, not uh, much has been accomplished already, but uh, when you've been a president for eight years, uh, perhaps you can't help thinking, how can I beat this? What's, uh, what accomplishments are next in store um, for me? And let me turn to some uh, poetry. Um, a famous poem says, above the mountaintops is peace, but there's also some solitude. And so, my question is, did you feel some emptiness come July the 2nd when this great achievement had been reached? Did you feel some concern about what could top it? What did you think? <laughs> I, I was uh, tired, <laughs> <at first. laughs> but I felt you know, enormous pride. Uh, you know, and whatever happens to the rest of my career, this will be one of my highlights. But as Adas said, in many ways, it's just, it's just the beginning. Um, and our greatest sense of pride and accomplishment or being at uh, the top of the mountain and that peace and solitude will be when we build out uh, this uh, standalone open RAN virtualized 5G network. 
that is really going to be the top of the mountain. Uh, you know, we have uh, the Sherpas, we have the oxygen. Uh, as you know, we're climbing uh, that mountain, confident that we can get there because we've done the preparation. Uh, so it's uh, certainly when you have something of this magnitude, the pride you feel, and then the next day it's well, it, you've gotten it. Uh, it's a little wait. I I have time to you know uh, do something uh, else, uh, but the the story is not yet. Uh, told. And that's what do you think? What did you feel? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it was it was so exciting, obviously, um, but it does not feel even close to the end of the story. Maybe we're, you know, at the halfway mark. I don't even know. I guess we'll find out <laughs> in 2023 what point we were at today, uh, on July 1. Um, I think the really exciting part about working at DISH is that we are always, um, in, in the eight years I've been here, sort of working on paradigm shifting um, proceedings, activities. And so, um, you know, I, I previously worked on a transaction that I thought might be sort of the, the most, one of the biggest highlights of my career. And then a few years later, I got to work on this. I don't know how you top this, but I'm sure because Dish provides, you know, these opportunities, and we're a unique player in the market. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure there's a lot of fun, interesting, um, cutting edge uh, work to come. So I am I am excited. Uh, unfortunately, in these coronavirus times, we could not take a proper vacation. <laughs> Though hopefully one day we can. Um, but the work continues, and I'm just excited to be a part of it. So it reminds one of what um, Churchill said mid-war, not the end, not the beginning of the end, but perhaps the end of the beginning. Yeah, and so, and so, let me ask each of you, and uh, perhaps uh, this time we can start with you, Hadas, to tell us uh, an anecdote from this uh, two-year saga that led to this becoming a fourth carrier. Which um, would you choose? There are so many, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick one that involves um, the three of us and some other important players at DISH, which is uh, to involve our chairman, Charlie Ergen, whose testimony in the Southern District of New York was a critical component of the trial. Um, and so we had a lot of involvement with um, Mr. Ergen through, you know, his the the trial preparations, depositions, um, testimony that got you know delayed over some days, et cetera. Um, and uh, <laughs> he has a real fondness for pizza and beer. <laughs> and so <laughs> during every large prep that we had, or even during trial, even in New York, amongst the best restaurants, um, we were always in search of just a slice of pizza. Uh, to to keep our you know witness happy and and satisfied and uh the, one of the funniest moments was in the middle of the deposition we took a dinner break and uh we were in search of obviously pizza and we found some sort of deep dish pizza place close to um the the site of the deposition and we you know ran in there to quickly just grab a slice of pizza beer to to be able to keep going it was pretty late at night we still had several hours to go and it was a deep dish pizza joint which we didn't think much of but it turned out that just getting a pizza the the estimate was that it would take like more than an hour which was longer than our dinner break and we were just you know pleading with this very proud waitress who you know was very proud of the way that the pizza was cr crafted and made and the deep dish style like just get us some something <laughs> quick enough that we can get back to the deposition so um and it, it obviously jeff and pentelis and myself and mr ergen were there um and so it was it was nice bonding to sort of find pizza all over, you know, Denver, New York, <laughs> Inglewood, Colorado. Um, and uh, and it's just sort of a funny anecdote, not really one that you think about in all of this, but just a sort of human moment um, that I always chuckle about. Well, that's a great slice, not only of pizza, but of <laughs> life. And it does make me nostalgic. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, what do you think? For me, it's the day that Charlie testified. It was a, a rainy day. Uh, we were at the law firm about a mile from the courthouse. Uh, there was a lot of media attention, and so people were coming in, you know, uh, cars and, you know, cameras and all of that. 
uh, and Charlie and I decided to walk to the courthouse, uh, you know, lower Manhattan. Uh, and so that walk in the rain, uh, we barely spoke because we understood how important this was and that the future of the telecom industry in the hands of a federal judge uh, that Charlie uh, was going to testify uh, in front of. And that will be a moment uh, that I will uh, never forget. Yes, that's a, that's a poignant work, uh, Jeff. Thank you. And, and let me. Uh, I, to, I just have to add to Jeff's anecdote. Yes. Very smart of him and Charlie to walk because, as you recall, the day of Charlie's testimony, you and I took an SUV black car to the courthouse. And there were already cameras staked out in front of the courthouse, thinking that, you know, this was the witness of the day, the star witness. And so I don't know if you recall, but there were cameras rolling as we exited. <laughs> cameras, flashes, uh, video, and um, you could feel the disappointment <laughs> in the in the paparazzi slash peanut gallery when who emerged was not, in fact, <laughs> Mr. Ergen, but I heard that uh, we were on some sort of highlight reel somewhere for a brief period of time. So I have tasted celebrity and it is overwhelming and I don't want it. <laughs> that <laughs> that's, was that's, ex that's exactly right. And we confirmed that um, you and I had us were featured on the first iteration of the show covering the testimony of that day until it was discovered by the show's producer that we were not in fact who um, <laughs> the paparazzi thought we were, and we were promptly excised from subsequent uh, broadcasts of that show. So, uh, thank you very much. I would like to close with a wish. And the wish is, we talked about um, the solitude of achievement and how one tops it, but the hope uh, and the wish, and I think the, the confident conviction is that when we hopefully reconvene in in the same video chat in a subsequent episode, whether it be in three or two years or next year, the we will be able to justly uh, describe this tremendous achievement as only the appetizer for even greater achievements to come. And with that, I would like to thank you so much, Jeff and Hadas, for making the time and uh, chatting with us. And I would like to thank all of our viewers.